Welcome to Tail Learn Code. Here there will be tales about software development, learning from each other, code to build solutions. And now your host, Chad Green. In pace with what, you know, rise to level your expectation. Yeah, I I hope I read that wrong. But I you know, I mean that's the way how I read that the other day. They were they were looking at doing that. And I'm like, well, um, actually, my thought was, don't do it for a couple more weeks till I get all these interviews done, because <laughs> I've got the Skype thing figured out. And, and but it's all about me, right? It's all that matters. So, <coughs> oh, <clears throat> sorry, I was trying to keep my evidently in the middle of my Channel Nine interviews. I did a commercial for McDonald's. <coughs> Well, I was going to ask you, you know, how come we're not seeing the cup? You know, no, uh, is this not sponsored tonight? <laughs> Gotta have my fountain soda. Uh, yeah, your fountain soda, and it, I, I mean, I'm assuming, well, I'm curious, now that you're, you know, you've been on uh, uh, quarantine, have you been getting enough uh, uh, Skyline? Oh, they've been open. It's drive through. Oh, I'm just. <laughs> Wasn't sure if you were getting out enough to, to get uh, Skyline or not. Yeah, I, I still get out. I, I do most of the errand running. Actually, when they when they announced the shutdown the first time, I went out to Costco and I got I got a, basically a pallet of Skyline. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think I ever told you, but you know, uh, my father was a not anymore because he's got health issues now. But I mean, he he used to be a big Skyline fan. And uh, it was one of the, you know, so he, he grew up in, in the Cincinnati area. Uh, um, so I, I remember like 10 years ago, I was able to find cans of Skyline. And I sent it down to Florida for him, you know, so he could actually get some of the experience of it. You know, it's not well, exactly the a, same thing, but. There's at least nine Skylines in Florida. Oh, really? And every single one of them is ran by an expat from Cincinnati. Well, that would make sense. And it was funny, we were down at uh, Cocoa Beach a couple years ago visiting my nephew who's down at the Air Force Base down there and saw there was a skyline. So I said, hey, kids, we're going to skyline. You know, oh, whatever. <laughs> I, said, I said, watch it. Somebody there is going to be tied to Cincinnati. <clears throat> and so we sit at the counter and, and talking to the shift supervisor, manager, whatever. And I said, so who's, who's tied into Cincinnati here? She goes, oh, that's me. Yeah, I ran um, a franchise back in Cincinnati, and then uh, we decided to move to Florida, so I opened a franchise here. So, so it's funny. I mean, the reason why I know, and again, I was telling everyone, I've known you for a long time. You and I are pretty good friends. But the reason why I know you're, you're such a fan of uh, Skyline was uh, Phil was in town this was a couple of years ago and uh, uh, came early. You know, he was speaking, uh, which admittedly, you, you usually have the biggest crowds. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, so he was speaking, he came early, and so he, he went to Skyline for lunch. And, uh, and, and I was like, well, how was lunch? And he was like, ah, you know, it, was, it, it, it wasn't made right. And I'm like, well, w w what's the difference? And, you know, it actually did explain, well, you know, the, the buns weren't steamed correctly, which are, right, I got that. But it's like, oh, no, I, I go to different Skylines. I, 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 know, I taste the difference. And I'm like, <laughs> they all come from the same place. What do you mean? <laughs> well, so... It, it all comes from the commissary, but it gets reconstituted by the stores. The mm -hmm. stores can choose to add more or less water and use different temperatures. And and it's also in how they make it. So there are three skylines equidistant from my house. If you want to say, you know, hub and spoke, if you want to be a geek about it. Um, and I will drive out of my way to go to a particular one because it's that much better than the other ones. I mean, you don't want to play the spaghetti in... in cheese and onions and, and no meat sauce well uh, so all right so because <laughs> i live in the same uh, i live in the relatively same area okay, what is skyline i mean you know for those who don't know what skyline is so so there's there's three kinds of chili um and, and this was one of the presidents actually said this there's there's texas chili there's um i don't know what the other chili he said was and then there's cincinnati chili and cincinnati chili is really a mediterranean meat sauce <laughs> So if you're thinking, you know, the big thick chili with humongous beans, that's not Skyline. It's it's a it's a meat sauce. Um, traditionally, you either eat it as a 
they call it a three way, which is spaghetti, chili, the, the meat sauce, and cheese. And then you can add onions for a four way and beans for a five way. Uh, or you can get cheese conies. So hot dog, uh, bun, chili, cheese, onion, to mustard. What I get are chili cheese sandwiches. You take the hot dog out. I don't like hot dogs. That way you get more chili. <laughs> so it's a Cincinnati thing. Yeah, it's definitely a Cincinnati thing. It's, I, I mean, I, I love the stuff. I mean, it's, uh, unfortunately, we're nowhere near a skyline where we live in Louisville because uh, uh, they're not as prevalent, right? And we don't have any gold star ch- uh, chili here either. Well, be thankful. Yeah, I, was, I think the only time I've had Gold Star was at the Dayton Mall. And that's because there wasn't much other choice. And I was, I was you know, well, let me try that. And it was all right. I mean, it's, you know, uh, um, I think I just, I got Tony's, right? So, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I just spoiled it, you know, to me with a Skyline with the, with the spaghetti and everything. Well, now we're several minutes in the interview. Let's actually introduce you. <laughs> like I told everyone, this is going to be a fun conversation. So, uh, uh, so uh, you know, so Phil knows this, but I mean, you know, uh, one of the great parts about having Phil is uh, Copalusa happens because you know happened originally because partially because of Phil. Um, I wouldn't have had speakers if it wasn't for Phil. Uh, uh, and, and the cool part was that Phil actually convinced folks. Go straight from the MVP summit to to Louisville to this conference that no one had ever heard of before. So it's uh, with I owe a lot to Phil. Uh, uh, um, you know, he's spoken every year. Um, we could, we we we, we up the year that we forgot to schedule it first. <laughs> well, no, you scheduled me for a workshop, but then you left me off the rest of the calendar. No, no, we completely didn't schedule you. Oh, you didn't tell me that part. Oh, Maybe I can't remember. No, no, we had. We had I know the, I definitely uh, didn't schedule any sessions. Yeah, we we had that was the point, and I didn't care to be to, to be totally honest. Right. I didn't care. I, I was giving my workshop. I love giving the workshop. Um, but the irony is, Chad had spent the week tweeting that he's going to have an entire track with <laughs> Phil because I had submitted like I don't know, you know, sixteen or eighteen sessions. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever you need me to do. And then the schedule gets announced, and I'm not on it except for the workshop. And I, to be to be completely transparent, I didn't care. I was fine with right, it. Right. Oh, yeah. uh, but it was just so funny because he spent the whole week tweeting, oh, we're going to have an entire fill track. He's going to be Phil a Palooza and everything else. And then nowhere. <laughs> I was I was trying so hard to make sure I didn't overschedule you. <laughs> I didn't schedule you at all. Yeah, sure enough. I mean, so uh, this is the second year in a row where you're only doing the workshop. Uh, um, and, and, you know, it's funny because I mean, you are really cool about it. You're like, look, I can do other things if you want me to. I don't really care either way. And, uh, yeah, as so I've told you, you know, everyone loves that workshop. You know, it's why, it's why I, I hope you always come back for it because it has always been a very popular workshop. Uh, um, yeah, which, I mean, so give it away. So it's the Develop an ASP.NET Core 3 app with EF Core in a day. Um, I've sent several of my employees through that, you know, over over the time who, who were just learning ASP.NET Core at that time and, and really got a good grasp of it. Um, I finally attended it last year, not not at my own conference, somewhere else. I don't have, to, I don't have time to attend a, a, a workshop at my, my conference. But, uh, even I learned something out of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, that's not really saying much. I, I'm so bad with any framework, so it's I have a lot to learn. Well, and you're a manager, so how much do you actually code anymore anyway? <laughs> that's why I do live streams, so I can, I can actually code. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny. I actually, you know, I've been with the company I'm right now for, what, a year and four months. I've yet to write code that's gone to production. Um, that is changing. I actually... I, I've, Commit well. I will commit it tomorrow because I, I need I need uh, help with something, any framework related. No, no, uh, yeah, out of curiosity. But uh, um, uh, so I will actually have something go go to production. <laughs> but uh, uh, so there, I do write production code. Yeah, but it sounds like you're having somebody else write it for you. No, actually, I can't get the stupid thing to start up. <laughs> 
and it, I, something's something's going on with the migration, and I, and I'm like, I don't I don't want to fool with it. I mean, you know, I I, I if, if only you knew somebody who could help you with that. Well, like I said, I I, I have the guy who who wrote the migration in that code you know, who can help me with it. Okay. So, and, and the other part, I mean, I mean, sure enough, he he he's really good at any framework. Uh, um, the other part is, is we're we're basically we're moving data from SQL Server to Azure Storage, and I'm kind of fooling around with the model, and so I would like him to do a peer review of, of what I did with the model. So, uh, but if you're moving data, why are you using EF as opposed to something like? Well, SS, I'm, I'm not moving all the data. No, no, I'm not using any framework to move the data. Okay. I'm moving the data. I wrote a C, C console app to do that. Uh, uh, but then, you know, to retrieve the data and, and to write new data. And it's not the whole, it's not the whole part of the model. It's, it's like uh, uh, one thing is just one column in, in a table. And another is a whole table that's used as part of a, a series of tables that are used together. So, uh, I like so wait, I, I heard you say console app. So is that your definition of production code? Is you wrote a console app? <laughs> oh, I actually have ASP.NET web uh, web API code going out. All right. Yes, I did write a console app. That I'm pretty impressed with because it, it moved uh, 52 million records in, in three hours. So that, that was actually kind of hard. Yeah, you could use SSIS and it'll probably be pretty easy. Uh, we were having problems with SS, uh, SSIS. Uh, um, the, it's a little bit tricky getting stuff to Azure Blobs. At, 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 you know, at that kind of quality. It, you know, that yeah. was that was the hard part. Because uh, we also fooled around with uh, uh, Azure Data Factory. And I got to work, but I was going to... Or no, I couldn't get that part to work. Uh, um, because of limitations in Data Factory. But then I was trying to, you know, so we could do it, like move from one environment to the other. And I got that to work, but it took 27 hours to do the move. I'm like, well, that's not, you know, that's not useful. Um, and, you know, and part of the reason why how, how this three hour job works is it spins up a, 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 a 64 core machine and I use every, every single one of those cores. And I just thread the workout. So. By the way, my interview of Chad Green is brought to you by McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, why not? I won't be as fussy as Channel Nine about it. Yeah, they're all right. So, anyway, enough about you. Um, <laughs> why well, you asked me about any framework? No, I did. No, no, it's fine. I, I, you, you sent me a list of questions. I don't know if we're going to use them or not. I don't care if we do. Nah, it's, it's well. Number one, it's the standards. What I said to everyone, but uh, uh, I, I was telling everyone in between, you know, it was, I had another interview and I was telling everyone in between, I'm like, well, you know, I, I wrote notes like I write for everyone. I'm like, I didn't really need any of these notes. Every, every bit on here, I know, right? Well, I was like, well, that reminds me, you know, make sure I, it's more of a checklist than those notes. But, uh, uh, sorry. So now, like I said, now we're, what, 20 minutes in or whatever. <laughs> ah, 14 minutes in. So, uh, so Phil, what do you do? Um, I solve problems. I mean, I mean, so my my title is director of consulting. I'm the chief architect. I'm also for one of my customers, the acting CTO. But really, what what I do is solve problems. I my goal is to make people's lives easier. Now, does that mean that they spend less time doing mundane stuff? Uh, they've got better access to their data or whatever. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. I work in a lot of different verticals, but at the end of the day, you know, when when I go talk to a customer, it, it's not what kind of software can I provide. It's what do you not like about your job, and how can I make that better? So really, it's just it's problem solving. It's mm -hmm. all it is. You know, I I happen to use tech to do it. Right, right. And of course, you know, and I can say this because I'm an old man too. So you're an old man. You've been doing this for a long time. But, uh, uh, yeah, I um, started in the 80s, actually, um, doing, actually, I guess, you know, you call it consulting. It was, it was freelance work. I was helping, in, actually, I was still in high school in the really early 80s, 
and I got paid. Sorry, I have an eyelash in my eye. Um, I got paid to help write. I believe it was Lotus. It might have been something even earlier than Lotus. My memory's a little fuzzy. Um, to write some macros to help a local ad magazine streamline their sales process. So I um, I hadn't yet turned 16, so that made it interesting. Um, but we worked it out. Uh, no, actually, I, I've been hanging around computers since I was, since the 70s, actually. My, my father was an executive Procter & Gamble, and there was a time where they said everybody above a certain level has to have a computer in the house. So he brought a computer home and it sat in the corner. He had no interest in it. Chemical engineer by trade, wasn't sure at that time how a computer would help him. And so I started playing with it. Uh, <clears throat> you know this about me, I don't like to lose anything. Um, so we, we had learned how to, we'll say share games amongst each other. You know, some of my, my friends at school and um, one game in particular was very frustrating, Sub Hunt. It was all ASCII, it was a little ship went across the screen, you hit the space bar, it dropped a depth charge. And I so I figured out how to break into the code and rewrote it so that I had a nuclear depth charge that would just clear the screen. <laughs> so anytime my scores weren't doing that great, I knew the key combination to hit and boom. So it's, it's always just come natural. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I, I don't know if you know this about me. I wanted to be a doctor. I had every intention of being a doctor. And in my junior year of high school, I was talking to my AP anatomy teacher and loved that course. <clears throat> but it was a lot of memorization, a lot of coloring, a lot of, you know, graphs and charts and, and pictures. And she said, well, you've got seven more years of this. And I said, what is this? She said, memorization. And I said, and what does that get me? She goes, that gives you an opportunity to try and become a doctor. And I said, I don't think I'm going to be a doctor. Yeah. So I went the paramedic route instead and, and did that for 15 years. And while I was doing the computer stuff. So. I was, so I, I, yeah, I, I did know that you wanted to be a doctor, but it doesn't surprise me. Because I mean, you, know, uh, you were a paramedic for so long. So, you know, yeah. it's funny. You're talking about taking anatomy in, in uh, high school. Uh, yeah, you know, I moved around a lot in high school, and uh, so when I was in school in Louisville, uh, so you know, freshman year you took biology because everyone everyone took biology freshman year, and then your sophomore year you either took chemistry if you were you know one of the smarter kids, or for all the all the jocks you took anatomy, and, and it was and it was anatomy for jocks, right? So you know, it was all jock terms, you know, which was great, right? I mean, it worked really well. But then we moved down to Miami. And they didn't have such an anatomy class. They had a regular anatomy class. And, <laughs> and I was just way out of my water. Because most everyone in there, you know, they were they were prepping to go to, you know, to pre-med, you know, in a year or two. And I'm just like, I'm just trying to get a grade. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, that was that was interesting. But uh, um, so how, how did you how did your professional career get started? Um, so I went to Washington University in St. Louis and um, went there entirely because of Anheuser-Busch. I, I knew nothing about the school. My dad wanted me to go to um, Illinois because they had one of the few craze at the time. And they had like this 30-page thing I had to fill out for admissions and essays and everything else. And I had done pretty well on the SATs and, and my grades were good. And I'd done a bunch of, I, I took six AP classes my junior year. So I could pretty much pick where I wanted to go back there in the eighties. And uh, my best friend wanted to go look at Washington university because he wanted to be an architect. And he said, Hey, you want to take college days and go to St. Louis? And I'm like, St. Louis, St. Louis, Ooh, Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. I said, I'm there. And so went and talked to the, the people there. They didn't have, a computer science degree per se, um, and you're about my age, most of the schools back when we were looking at colleges had MIS degrees, mm -hmm. which was in the school of business, it was a lot of four channel, a lot of things like that. Wash U had one of the few that was an engineering degree in the school of engineering. And talked to him about it, and I said, what is, you know, what is the course load like? 
And he said, well, it's all the engineering stuff. So, you know, unfortunately, I had to take all the physics and chemistry and everything else, stuff that I don't really use. Um, but it was engineering. And I said, well, what's your admission process like? And, they, and I had brought copies of everything. <clears throat> and he said, well, you qualify for early admission. And I said, well, what does that mean? And they handed me a piece of paper. And I said, what is this? They said, that's your application. I said, wait a minute. One piece of paper? Do you have a pen? And I sat there and I wrote it out and handed it to them. They interviewed me and accepted me. Um, and, and so I went to Washington. I didn't even look at any of their schools. Uh, but it was it was good that it was in a school of engineering in that it, it gave me a really solid background in, in that way of thinking. Uh, the, the bad part about it, and, and I think a lot of schools are this way, is like a lot of my professors I never met. And it wasn't because I wasn't going to class. It was because they didn't teach the classes. They had their, you know, their TAs doing all the teaching. Um, but one professor that had a lasting impression on me, he didn't, but his class did. It was a 500 level, it was a graduate level class. And we had to learn a new language every week. <laughs> so we had a problem to solve. But each every week we had a problem to solve. And it was a new language each week. Uh, so it was Lisp one week. It was, um, we did... Ada, we did a lot of Ada back then. Um, you know, a lot, of, I can't remember all the different languages. And I hated it at the time. But I tell you what, you know, having that, having to be forced to go out of your comfort zone and learn something new. I remember Andy Hunt in the Pragmatic Programmer talks about go out and learn a new programming language every year just mm -hmm. to expand your horizons. <clears throat> well, in the .NET space, we're doing that anyway, right? Because every edition of .NET Core has been a complete rewrite of the prior, <laughs> and, and everything's changing. Um, but no, I do appreciate that sentiment because if you get locked in a certain way of thinking, you know, again, what what I like to, to believe that I do in my job is solve problems and make people's lives easier. And if I only know one way of doing things. And it's be more like an SAP implementation where it's not like we're going to make your business better. You, your business has to match SAP and then you'll be better. Uh, you know, it's right now my largest customer is a law firm and I've never done work in the legal space before. Um, but it's, you know, they deal with, they, they, they vet leads, right? So they're out there collecting leads for different things and then they have intake and they go through this whole process to see if it's a valid you know, the valid potential for a case, and then they send it out to co-counsel. So they're really a data firm just happens to be in the legal industry. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, they're dealing with, you know, they're, they're clearing, you know, 250, 300 leads a day. And one of the problems that they're running into is their main case edit screen in their existing software is taking six, seven, sometimes 10 seconds a load. Right, so somebody calls in, they have to, to sweet talk them, install them until the screen loads. And, and unfortunately, it's architected in such a way, it was written in such a way that it can't just be tweaked. So we're reloading, re -re ugh, easy for me to say, rewriting it in core. And, you know, we're getting sub second response times on the pages. A lot of that's because of technology improvements, but also because we're focusing on what they need as opposed to, you know, what they had. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's, again, it comes down to how can we make lives better? And, and you know, I write line of business apps, right? Uh, but there's all kinds of things that we can do with technology to improve lives. And it's not just in what we do in our everyday lives, but also how we can make other people better at what we do. And that's one of the reasons why I got in. There's two reasons I got into public speaking. One, I had been a trainer for a long time. And, you know, so it was natural for me to go do this community thing, uh, or so I thought. And I just remember the first time I spoke at a, a community event, that was a last minute fill in for somebody who was an event here in Cincinnati. And um, God, this had to be early 2000s. I mean, it might have been .NET 1.1. And Microsoft had just released the data blocks. And I actually was on the project where that was created. So the organizer called me up the day before and said, hey, we had somebody drop out there and talk about the data blocks and .NET. Can you come in and talk? I said, sure. And so I took my classroom mentality into here and I had, you know, death by bullets and 
you know, straight on lecture for 60 minutes and it was horrible. It was probably the worst session that anybody's ever given in history. And I got a confirmation that a few years ago, I bumped into somebody who was in that talk and he goes, yeah, it sucked. Um, and I'm not denying it, right? It was terrible. It was, it was the wrong environment. Um, and I went into the speaker room and I, I sat there looking around at all the people that were in there just talking and getting to know each other. And I'm like, all right, this, this is actually where I want to be, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've always wanted to be the dumbest person in the room because then all you can do is learn. And, and so, so that really got me kicked off into this whole public speaking. And I remember for about two years straight, um, I just, and back then you couldn't throw a rock and not hit a code camp in Ohio, Kentucky, you know, Michigan and Tennessee. And so every weekend I was off either sleeping in my car or couch surfing or things like that, just honing my craft. But then what started happening is I got better at this thing. I started seeing the faces of the people in the audience when they get it, right? When when I do when I explain something or show them something, and this just happened and I, I got it across Twitter with this series I did on EF Core for Channel 9. We did a 14-part series. And I had several people tweet me that I significantly helped them in their work by doing these 20 minute episodes. They're like, we're trying to solve X problem. We're doing it the hard way. And I saw what you talked about and, and we found a much better way to do it. So it's just so rewarding to me to, to have somebody come up and say, oh my gosh, I, you know, you helped me with a problem. You know, this, that, and the other. Matter of fact, talking about bringing Code of Blues into this, VS Live, um, back when we were doing in person, which hopefully we'll be doing in person again. But I was at VS Live Redmond last year and I was helping um, somebody with their workshop. And a lady came in and sat down next to me and she said, You spoke, you gave a talk at Code of Palooza that absolutely changed my life. And I'm like, Great, you know, um, can you tell me what that talk was so I can bring it back? <laughs> um, but it was uh, it was a soft skill talk, um, and she didn't remember the title or anything. But but that's really you know the motivation for me is to to get out there and, and if it even if it is story time with Phil, to have you know some of my experience and, and my many mistakes that I, I I talk about openly. You know, hey, I did this wrong, and here's a better way to do it. Um, to help people to get over, you know, whatever hurdle they have or whatever bridge they have and, and, and make it better that way. So, you know, that's kind of the two prong approach about why I do what I do in technology. If that makes any sense, I think I rambled. Yeah, but we all just love listening to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, oh, did you send me a message in the chat? Did you say, shut up, Bill, you're talking too much? No. No. Okay. The little chat thing was shown up. I saw. I sent you a picture of a corgi because we just got a corgi. I, I saw that uh, Facebook or Twitter. I saw that. Yeah. What's up? Well, I heard the corgi the other week when I was talking to you on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he was a little wound up. Because um, I, I remember my dog was barking and your dog decided to bark you know, against my dog. Yes. <laughs> Chain reaction. Which I, I was just grateful that my dog could not hear your dog because it would have started my dog going more. You know, it is funny. There's a so my dog's a, a what they call a bocker, so a, a eagle cocker, cocker spaniel mix. And in our cul de sac, there's a, a purebred uh, uh, beagle. And I swear the two of them are talking all the time through the window, right? You know, and <laughs> maybe they're reading lips. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but it'll be hilarious because you, you hear that dog go outside, and, and I, I feel like he's trying to, hey, hey, Bruno, where are you at? You know, and you know, you know, you hear our dog. We're gonna run up to the window to to, to bark at him. But uh, no, that's cool. So I, I, I would guess because uh, uh, I think the only soft skill talk you did at Copalooza was a couple years ago when you did the uh, keynote. I wonder. I wonder if that was what it was, which was a you did a keynote on, on leadership. Yeah, um, I I have to go back because I I keep track of all the stuff because mm -hmm. I'm a pack rat. Uh, there were some others that I did that were kind of on the agile side. I don't know. Well, it could, yeah, it could have been one of the agile ones too. Um, I don't know, but it was 
you know, and at the end of the day, it didn't matter. It it it, it helped her. She was appreciative of it. Um, I guess it, the only thing that really matters is I'm like, Shh, damn, if that was that good of a talk, I should bring it back, whatever yeah. it was. <laughs> um, but all these things evolve over time, you know. So. Because you're so good about, uh, you yeah. know, cleaning up your talks and not doing old talks anymore. Um, I mean, it's, so, it's part so, of the joke why we can have a whole whole, whole track with just Phil, right? It's... Yeah, so I, I only talk about things that I actively work on. Yeah. Um, I've never been one of those people to say, oh, I want to learn Kotlin, so let me submit a Kotlin talk. So, um, And then I'll take things out of the rotation. Like I used to do a lot of talks on WPF because I was – doing a lot of WPF and we still do with our shop floor systems that we do in manufacturing, mm -hmm. but not enough to, to talk about it. Um, but yeah, so it just, you know, when, and I hate this term and I'm going to say it anyway, but when you do full stack in .NET, there's a lot of things you can talk about, right? So I'm constantly dealing with, with, um, SQL, you know, and mostly from an EF core standpoint, but there's also things in SQL that you need to know about. Um, Obviously, EF Core and ASP.NET Core go hand in hand, which then also is C Sharp. Um, I'm going to start adding some talks about Azure Functions because I'm starting to do those now too. <laughs> and I've I've learned that there's good things about Azure Functions and there's really crappy things about Azure Functions, yeah, yeah. like the fact that something will work one day and then you don't change your code at all and it breaks the next day because they've decided to change how the startup code works in an Azure Function version three yes i'm still a little bitter about that one because it 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 bit me in the butt no i had and, I, and chad was a big help right i i had never done azure functions never looked at and talked to chad at, at length to see if i even wanted to go down that route and that's one of the good things about going to a conference i coded palooza where you have so many different topics is you can go to and i would recommend that if you're coming to code palooza we're well, not coming to code palooza if you're watching Code of Palooza from your home, <clears throat> to go to talks that are talking about things that you don't do and you haven't done. Um, you're going to learn some things if you listen to all the talks that you do, you know, the things you do work on, but it's, it's too much like an echo chamber. And that's one of the things I've always done at BS Live when I was an attendee before I was a speaker is I'd always go to talks of things I didn't do. Um, so I could see what was out there. And so I wanted to learn, should I look into this thing called Azure Functions? And so, you know, I talked to Chad several of them were down about in Louisville for a viable term and I kind of kicked it off and then some phone calls. So then I'm like, all right, so so here's Phil who can't just skim the surface of anything. I'm gonna dive in, I'm gonna learn how to do DI with Azure Functions. I'm gonna tie in Sarah Log and, and the whole ASP.NET Core dependency injection framework. You know, all this stuff because it fits this architecture that I have that works really well. And it worked beautifully, right? I even followed Microsoft guidance with their startup, you know, from the functions, inheriting function startup. And everything worked. Didn't change any code. Redeployed because I changed some dates in it. And all of a sudden, it, it wasn't running the startup code anymore. And then um, talked to another friend of mine. He said, oh, well, here's how we do it. And it turns out that if you go back to the old documentation, it'll work. But... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think they're struggling a little bit with 3.0. Um, I, I think it'll clean up, you know. But it, yeah, it, it was it was a big move. Uh, yeah, but the, the rule about Microsoft was always don't touch it until it gets to 3.0, right? Well, you know, uh, but also if you look at Azure Functions, every version has been a a pretty drastic change. You know, version one was, was them figuring out how to do serverless. You know, version two was really a stabilization, and, but it was still pretty drastically different. You know, version three brought it, you know, brought in .NET Core, brought in the whole, you know, all the uh, cross-platform, all that type of stuff. Um, the good thing is, I mean, I, you know, I heard Jeff Holland talk uh, a couple weeks ago that they're not going to, uh, to .NET Core 5. They have no plans to. Um, and I hope I'm not saying something that I'm not supposed to say, but I'll say it anyway. So just by where I said it, but but uh, uh, and, and and their reasoning was was that because uh, it's not going to be LTS, right? And and so they you know they want to make sure they only support LTS. But I think because they made that decision, 
will give them a chance to get Azure Functions 3.0 more stabilized. Well, and I, 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 you know what? I'm totally fine with breaking changes between versions, but this was still a 3.0 function that broke one day. Oh, no, I, uh, I got what you said. <laughs> I have not experienced that, but I, it, it doesn't, you know, so I'm not surprised, right? It, it's, it's, yeah. And, and I was talking to, to Brian Randall, and, and he, um, who, who lives in Azure all day long, and he said, well, go back to the way we used to do it with the weblog startup function, so I'm going to try that. But it, I mean, I got it to work outside of that, um, but it's just, you know, frustrating. But, you know, you bring up LTS, and that's, that's a really good point, because I just had this discussion again with my editor, and, and you can see the, the books behind me, right? So Pro C Sharp A with Core, yes, relate to the game. There's a whole lot of reasons why. Uh, the, the biggest reason is it's a 1,500-page book, and I rewrote it every single page I touch, every single code sample, because it was all written on .NET Framework, and I rewrote everything to work on Core. So humongous shift on that. Uh, but it's in .NET Core 3.1. And, and, of course, my publisher is like, well, why don't you do, you know, why can't we do .NET Core 5? And I said, because we're going to run into the same problem that we had with the first uh, web applications book that we built. The latest version is on, I can't tell my right or left because everything's backwards in OBS. Um, in that we're going to go live with a version and then they're going to change it. So 5.0 is going to be a current version of .NET Core or just .NET 5 is they're, they're dropping the core title. Although they're quick to say it's optional to drop the core title. And what people don't understand is Current doesn't mean what you should be on. Current is short-term support. Mm -hmm. So when 5.0 gets released and people run and flock to it, because a lot of people at Microsoft are saying, hey, you should always be on the latest and greatest. And then you go, and then 5.1 gets released, which I don't know if it will or won't, but it probably will, looking at the history of core, then 5.0 is going to go out of support in three months. Yep. Right. So do you really want to have to then shift to 5.1 and what does a 5.2 and a 5.3 where 3.1 is going to be good for another three years minimum. But probably if Microsoft is on time through all of the COVID stuff, 3.1 is going to be good for at least another four years. But from a marketing perspective, right, we're not in the latest. So I think we're going to solve that by having a... Um, but a C sharp nine book will be on both. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to ask what you're going to do for C sharp nine. Yeah, so we're going to do both, right? So, um, but do you really need not, to? I mean, could you not just stick it with three one? I mean, there's there's I, no new. Is there any new features in C sharp nine that is dependent on five? I haven't done the research yet. Okay. Lord, I've just finished this book. Give me a time to breathe. Okay. No. No. Yeah. It's. I, I, okay, let me rephrase it. From what I've seen, I have not seen anything that is dependent on .NET 5. I haven't done enough digging. I don't even have 5 loaded on my machine yet because I was worried about breaking some of the code samples. I, I, well, that's a smart thing because I <laughs> I have broken a couple of things because I have 5 loaded. Actually, the worst is you create, you know, I, I end up creating a project, you know, like a simple little console app, and also it just really screws me up because I, you know, it's running five and I run into conflicts. So I'm like, oh crap. Well, it's bad enough. So I run uh, Visual Studio Preview as well as the Visual Studio RTM, and I keep having to put global.json in my projects because the preview is upping the SDK for a pre release SDK because mm -hmm. the preview needs it. And then all of a sudden, you know, it, People who work for me are like, hey, we can't load this project, right? The thing isn't working. Oh, you know, so. Yep, no, that, that's the exact problem I've had. Yeah, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've, and luckily, nothing I've checked in because I hardly check anything in, but, uh, but, uh, I've at least now learned to make sure that, you know, when I go in and create a new project, that I make sure that, uh, uh that I create it correctly. Uh, which, which is hard because actually, Visual Studio does not give you that option. I wish it, I wish it would give you the option when you create the projects to, uh, you know, be, what kind of project you talk about? Yeah, even like a even like a class library, it won't let you. You know, oh no, class library, you're stuck. Um, if you're doing um, HP.NET Core, then it will definitely. Um, okay, well, 
let you pick. But uh, but console app class. I mean, I have I have not created an ASP the core app in a while. So can you see me? Because my screen is yeah. blank. Okay. No, All I right. see. I, I think I must have kicked something. So, uh. um, my main not my laptop, but my main monitor is what what power down. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so that's something that, that you run into, right? So you're you're working in, you know, I've got I still have a couple projects out there in production 2.1, and as much as I would like to to lift and shift to a 3.1, um, it just you know I, I I can't I can't find a business reason to do that. Um, well, what about the fact it goes out support next year? I'm sorry. Uh, what about the fact it goes out support next year? Um, at the end of 2022. Uh, that was December 2021. Now you're gonna make me bang it. And everybody gets dead air as we <laughs> are looking it up. Uh, 2.1. Uh, August 21, 2021. Yeah. Well thought. Yeah, I mean, it's, but that's still, right? It's over a year. Yeah. No, I, so, I, I mean, the main reason I know it, because we, so last year we, you know, I, I made the decision that, you know, we, we won't go to any current release unless we really, really have to, um, which has to be approved by me and the, and the VP. And then, uh, uh, and then, you know, looking at our upgrade path. So we actually just upgraded to two one last year. We're going to, because three one was, because I knew three, I knew three O was going to be current. You know, right. um, and so we're actually, Either September or October, we're going to be working on a project to uh, uh, upgrade to, to 3 1. So, uh, and the reason was is because 2 1 is going to go you know, expire soon. Uh, well, the next biggest year. problem going from, from 2 1 to 3 1, you should be okay because I, I think I remember you saying you guys don't really use EF Core. No, we use EF Core a lot. Oh, well, then um, you know how to get a hold of me for consulting hours. <laughs> I would say we're, we are heavily dependent on EF Core. There are. I am not heavily dependent on EF Core. <laughs> there are a ton of breaking changes between 2.1 and 3.1. And I agree with almost all of them, but there's still a lot of breaking changes. So it's there's some things you're going to have to, to think about, and hopefully you've got lots of tests in place. Yeah, we, we do. Well, we have a lot of manual tests in place. Uh, uh, working on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we we've already I mean, we've identified them. We're we're and we're. Um, I, I I gotta admit, this is the best team I've ever worked with. Uh, and they they they've got it all worked out. So it's just a matter of um, the reason why we have done it is because we well one because we've been busy, but the other is we need a code freeze to do it for obvious reasons. I'm gonna go and change my API that runs the whole thing. Well, but with with Microsoft's decision to, and, and this was, 3.0 was only going to work on .NET Standard 2.1. And then with 3.1, they backed down and said you can work on .NET Standard 2.0. So I don't know that you really need a code freeze because you could start that migration now, right? If you change your, your class libraries to, well, you're probably doing .NET Standard anyway, right? Um, no, actually, we, we've got it all wrapped into the, the ASP.NET app. Ew. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that was my outside voice. I meant to control that. <laughs> it is what it is. <sighs> anyway. Um, yes, there are. Know, no, I mean, there are some class libraries also, but the, the primary API, it, it, it's all, it's all into, you know, it's all in the uh, same project. Okay, another subject. It's uh, someone took on a very big project, and yeah. you know that's the way how he built it, right? And um, 
And sure enough, I mean, they they went through the whole. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna build a a, a one one app, and and they realized how bad that was. One one was okay if you had a very narrow use case. Yeah, well, this is not a very narrow use case. Okay. This is, this is a whole medical platform, you know, or medical learning platform, right? You know, it's um, that's why I, I've told him. I said, look, I you know, not great. I know I know the guy who was the architect before me. Um, I was like, I don't even talk to him. I know he had a hard time building this thing. I, I don't even have to ask him one question, and I know he had a hard time because you know, one one. It wasn't that it was a mess. I mean, it was just, you know, Microsoft was still trying to figure out what they were doing with it and, and how to make it work. Well, but also, I mean, you know this, but I don't know how many of your listeners know that this wasn't an evolution of ASP.NET. This was a rewrite. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, I'm sure there is some clipboard inheritance between the old code and the new code, but but they were starting over, which is awesome, right? Because how many, how many projects do you have out there where you just go, oh, boy, I'd love an opportunity just to redo that, right? You know, call a do-over and, and start over. Um, but the problem is it takes time, right? <laughs> and and it was, you know, when you look at 1.1, one, one, especially EF Core, it was missing a ton of features from EF6. And it had just enough to support a basic HPI that core web app. Um, 2.1 is when I think they both really hit their stride. And that you could do pretty much what you needed to do. In both ASP.NET Core and EF Core, and actually EF Core was was advanced enough in 2.1 that that's when we started using it as our data access layer for our WPF apps. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got so out there in production WPF apps running on on .NET Classic. I'm calling it because nobody has a really good name for it, uh, but we're running EF Core as a data access layer. Um, you know, 3.1 just continues to I don't think amaze is the right word, but there's so many things that just work. Um, sometimes it's going to take you a week to figure out how to make it just work because the documentation for the most part is good, but then there's that missing piece of documentation that you need. Um, but yeah, it's really well thought out. So it will be interesting to see the changes that come in five and, and how quickly people adopt them. I mean, five mostly is about Maui unification, but I... Well, actually, now that's going to be six. I can't... Well, can we say that out loud? Yeah, they said you, the build. You just did. So they, I believe Chad said it, not me. So. No, no, they said the build. Did they? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure how much that was public or not. No, uh, I... So I actively watched build because I was curious to see between what was told to us and what, you know, what was going to be said. Uh, um... Well, I was actually, it was pretty interesting how open they were. Because, uh, um, you know, before Build, you know, it was pretty much MVPs who knew that, you know, Maori was coming and all that kind of stuff. They could have easily just said, yeah, here's what we're working for six. But they, they came straight up and said, yeah, we were going to try to get to the five, but it's not going to happen to six. Well, but, but also keep in mind that they don't really have a choice but to be open. I mean, the whole shift between .NET standard 2.1 is a requirement and backing down to 2.0. I was sitting in a speaker room somewhere with Jim Woolley and he was just going through the latest check-ins and he goes, what? I'm like, what? He goes, EF Core is now on .NET Standard 2.0. And they're like, what? And so we're looking at the check-in and sure enough, you know, before they announced they were reverting, mm -hmm. it was there in GitHub. Yeah. So if you got the time to you know to look through it, you're going to see that kind of stuff. Yeah, but like Maui was done in private repo, so you wouldn't know have seen that. Yeah, that's true. So and Microsoft said, I mean, they're they're going to do as much as possible in in the public, but some stuff they're going to do as private repos first. But never there is a timeline that they have that the, you know once they create a private repo, they have X amount of time before they're supposed to. Put it into the public repos, but well, unless there's some global pandemic that affects their productivity, and I'm, I'm sure there's there's parachutes that they can. Yeah. Well, it's actually pull interesting. Out. You know, they because uh, uh, you know I heard Scott Hunter talk about how they actually had to, to back developers up out because the, the developers were too, doing too much. They were actually being too productive, right? And. Uh, Basically, he was saying it was that uh, uh, you know, he, he was saying especially like they're single guys, 
Because these, these guys had nothing to do. So all they did was code all day long. And and, and they, they finally had to say, you know, that's that's awesome, but we don't want you working, you know, ninety hours every week, you know. Right. So, um and then on the flip side you got everyone else who, you know, and I, and, and so they uh, uh so now they've been very public the fact that they, they backed that out. Um which, to be honest with you, uh, I don't see much in the way of going, you know, uh, as a reason to go to, to five. Because uh, um, it's really just a stepping stone at this point. So, you know, with 3.x, they've decoupled EF Core from ASPR Core, right? So you can pick mm-hmm. whichever version of EF Core you want, but you have to because it's no longer included in Microsoft.ASP.net.all. Um, there are some cool things yeah. coming in EF Core 5 that might make it worth looking at um, pending the risk of being a current release and, and everything else. Um, specifically around performance and inner joints and outer joints and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Is, I mean, there's some some niceties they caught up with, but they really working on performances. They fixed the M plus one issue with 3.x um, with correlated subqueries. And then now they've got some interesting things happening in five. But my concern about that is the way they're fixing it. I wonder if we're regressing away from the batching mm. updates. Oh, but see, there, there's where it's a shame of the, of the policy they went to. The, the current and LTS policy, because you know it, it's .NET Core. It's everything that's .NET Core, right? Or, or I guess will eventually just be called .NET, right? Uh, uh, so any framework falls under the same thing. And at least, no, granted, they got what's changed this, but according to the documentation, .NET, you know, any framework five will only be a current release because everything .NET five is a right. current release. Yeah, I mean, it's still going to be current. Um... But it, I might look at pulling that in, and again, having your, depending on the on the surface API of core. I don't, from what I've looked at, it hasn't changed that much, if at all. Um, it's something you go always back out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, previews for Maui will ship in November of 2021. Right. Right. So. What they said was right after they launch five, the first previews of six are going to be out. Oh, and they're targeting GA in November 2021, so a year and a half from now. So, mm-hmm. and .NET six, six will be LTS. So, yeah, yeah. So, with the, so I mean, so they they are making progress in six, right? Or, or what you know, what Maui is supposed to be, uh, because like I said, they, they what they said was right after and. I wonder if right after means like the, the moment that uh, that, that cough is done. Here you go. Here's the preview. You know, probably like one of the final things they'll say is, okay, now you can also get the preview for six, right? Right. Uh, um, which is going to include Maui, which I got to admit, you know, that was probably the most exciting thing I heard at the MVP Summit was Maui. And I'm not a front end guy, right? But I, I just I just thought that was a really neat thing. I, you know, I really liked it. Um. I thought it, it addresses a lot of the, the complaints, you know, like the press and everyone has about Microsoft, uh, um, at least Microsoft, you know, that part of Microsoft. So I, I was, uh, I was really, I mean, there were some other things I was really excited for, some of which I still can't talk about, but, right. uh, um, you know. And, I mean, and to be clear for the people watching this, if you don't know what Maui is, um, it is a place in the 50th state, but it's multi-platform app UI. And it's uh, the unification, if you will, of um, Mono and .NET Core and Xamarin into one code base. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's funny you should bring out the you know the the people who are complaining about Microsoft things. Uh, there are people who are going to complain about Microsoft regardless. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. right. I, I I don't remember who it was. Somebody from the .NET Core team put out a, a Twitter poll of. You know where does C sharp run, and people were shocked that it can run on Linux, mm-hmm. right? And they're like, and then people were spinning that in such a stupid way. 
Super is probably too strong of a word. No, they were putting it in super way that, you know, Microsoft's trying to take over Linux and everything else. And it's just like, no, it's just, it's a tool, right? Can we just all get along and deploy where we want to deploy? Yeah. Well, that's part of the hard part. I mean, the, the quote unquote open source community, you know, doesn't want to be open to Microsoft entering the open source community, right? You know, it's, uh, um, well, I mean, they sur- they survived the Balmore years, so they've got a reason to be a little bitter, right? Sure. Sure. But I, I always laugh with, you know, uh, granted, we can't go to events anymore, but, you know, when we go to events and, I, you know, and I, I show up at like the, at the, uh, the uh, open source user group, and of course, you know, everyone knows I'm a Microsoft developer. They're like, why are you here? I'm like, well, I do open source too. <laughs> Like you're a Microsoft developer. Yeah, exactly. It's all open source, right? Yeah. Uh, but it actually goes back to your point. You were talking about when you go to conferences. I, I, I went to the open source group because I want to learn about, you know, Linux and all that, you know, all that good stuff. Um, this is an architect. You know, I need to know that kind of stuff. And then just say I don't like it anyways. <laughs> I remember years ago, and I had I had committed to Microsoft long before .NET came out, um, early in the BB days actually, and then we were doing a lot of classic, well I don't even know what you call it anymore, ASP pages, right? So classic, classic, prehistoric, whatever. <laughs> and then uh, I remember when .NET came out, I, I actually I bought Trollson's book and read it cover to cover and. Um, you know, they started you know doing all lectures on .NET and everything else, and in trainings and, and things like that. And I just remember a customer of ours; they had decided, and this is so typical, right? They got a new CIO, so they were dumping all of Microsoft and going to Java. And two years ago, you know, two years prior to that, they had gotten a new CEO and dumped all Java to go Microsoft. So I knew it was a two-year cycle. And they said, well, we really want you to stay on. And I said, well, but you're switching to Java. And they said, yeah, but we wrote this rec just for you, right, to match you because we wanted to make sure we got you. And I said, I don't want to, I don't want you, right? You're going to Java. <laughs> and I said, I have nothing against Java. I just don't do it, right? right. Uh, but I've got plenty of people at my company who do Java, so I'll bring somebody in to help you out. And they just they couldn't believe it. And you know, it, it, it goes kind of circles back. And, and if people are confused about what I said earlier, where technology is just a tool, it is. But you want to be able to know how to use those tools. Mm-hmm. Right? And I'm really, I like to think I'm really good at the Microsoft stack. And when I come up with an idea of how to improve somebody's workflow or, you know, cut costs or make them more productive or generally make their jobs easier. I don't want to be fighting the technology to do it, right? I want to know how to use it. Uh, my my middle son, who really wants to go into the trades, and I support that completely, um, as long as he has a business plan, and we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, but we, I, I've got nice tools, right? I don't use them as much as I would like, but I've got a nice set of tools. It reminds me of a line from a movie. Hey, my cousin's got an awesome set of tools. Um, but we made him go down and take classes, right, um, prior to the lockdown. And I said, you can't use this until you learn, you know, until you actually take a class and learn how to use it and get better at it. Because, um, A, I don't want him cutting his finger off. And, B, you can spend a lot of time, you can waste a lot of time fighting the tooling if you don't understand it. Mm-hmm. So uh, how have you been doing with the pandemic? We've been fine here. I mean, we're we're in uh, Butler County, which is not the county of Cincinnati's, and we're north of it. Um, you know, we went through the lockdown like everything else, but it's – I don't want to get political, but it was interesting how they decided what was essential business and what wasn't essential business. Um, we had – when I had heard that it was going to get – the lockdown was going to happen um, – we got, I went out to Costco and Sam's and stocked up and we had a freezer full of meat and everything else. And, you know, just in case, but it's been fine. I mean, the grocery stores have been stocked except for toilet paper for whatever reason. Um, you know, but luckily we had just 
you know, I happened to be at Costco before all this happened and said, oh, we need toilet paper. So I got the, you know, 9,000 roll thing you get at Costco. Um, we ate out. We ate in a lot more, but we bought, I don't know how to say this, we didn't eat out because we weren't eating out. I went through a lot more drive throughs than we normally would. Um, and it wasn't because we were trying to do anything other than help them stay in business. Yeah. You know, and so we were we were hitting drive throughs for things where we normally would just make a lunch, right? And I'm like, oh, hey, you know, I'll go to Chipotle or whatever, whoever's open, uh, just to help them try and stay afloat. Um, because I, I worked in food service in the past and, you know, and, and I'm not going to get political at all. But the hardships that, that a lot of the restaurants were going through, and, and a couple of my customers that are in manufacturing, they're having a hard time keeping people on the, the shop floor because they were getting more from the unemployment <laughs> and the bonus checks than they would have made working there. And everybody has to do what's right for them, right? So I'm not blaming anybody for anything, but it was just an interesting situation. And we were able to, with one of our customers, we were able to help them actually we changed priorities of what we were working on and we actually donated some hours um, to fix some things so they didn't need as many people to do a particular job um, but yeah no it's been it's been fine and uh, my sister-in-law and her husband uh, tested positive um, it was a a mild case of the flu for them <laughs> um, is what they had um, matter of fact my sister-in-law called my wife and said hey guess what I've got covid and, and just in that tone, right? It, 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 and I'm not making light of it. I know people have died from it. And it's a horrible, it can be a horrible disease. But our personal um, encounter with it, she's like, I feel like I have the flu, right? And so if you get it, hope that's the, the level you get it. Uh, my family's been fine. My daughter's going back to, she's going to be a freshman. They're doing volleyball. They had to suspend classes because, or suspend workouts for four days. Um, get everybody tested, everybody came back clean or negative, I should say. Um, and so they're back at it. So it's, you know, other than everybody being home more than they would have been in the past, we've been fine. I would say your wife might not, must not know what to do with you now. Yeah. Well, so one of the first things I did was I bought a 33 inch monitor and a, um, I don't know what you call it, but a, a big light that you put above everything, you know, for podcasters. You, you probably know what it's called because you're on Twitch all the time. Uh, but I, I've made my house here. So I've got my 226s. I've got my 43-inch. i got my laptop. i got a TV in my office. I never have to leave my office. So <laughs> my wife doesn't even know that I'm home. <laughs> That's not much different then. <laughs> no. No, in case I wander out for a Diet Coke. and Oh, you're here? I'm like, yeah, I'm just get refilling on my Diet Coke. Sure. For, for those who don't know Phil, Phil is always on the road, right? It, it's, it's it's pretty much a constant. Yeah, it's um, it, it'll be interesting because I'm I'm lifetime platinum with Marriott, and there's no well, there is lifetime, but I haven't hit it. Um, but I've been I've been between platinum and diamond with, um, Delta for you know a whole bunch of years and and now i've got a humongous amount of credit with delta because i had to cancel so many flights um it'll be interesting to see what happens and there's bigger problems that people are facing this so i'm not i'm not complaining it would be interesting to see what happens you know what the, the the travel companies do for the loyalty programs for next year. Yeah. Same thing with the MVP program, right? There's talk about what's gonna happen, right? It's, if it's based on con community contributions and there's no community, that, then how does that work? So it's, it, it's, I'm not complaining because I've got life really good. I know people are, are struggling out there. Um, for me, it's more of a curiosity from a customer service standpoint of, of how those things get resolved, right? You know, what's the decision process going around it? Well, it's interesting um, to mention MVP. There, there's been some rumbling on, on Twitter that there are fewer MVPs right now, but not as many. There are a lot fewer. If you looked at, and this isn't public, but if you go back and look at your welcome email from Betsy, it has a number in there. Hmm. And that number is a lot lower than what it was. Well, I... Actually, I haven't read that email yet. So, and I don't know if it's public knowledge, which is why I, I'm not trying to dance around the subject. 
So, yeah, well, so, so on Twitter, where people said they were noticing the public profiles, which of course not 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 everyone has their profile public, right? So it's it's not the best gauge to look at, anyways. But they, they you know some people have noticed that the number is lower on the on, on the number of public profiles. Yeah, I don't know. And and for those of you who aren't familiar with the MVP program, I, I don't know if you've explained to your listeners in the past how. It yeah, works. I'm sure we've talked about it before. So it, it's a you know it's an annual thing. It's based on your it's a it's a look back. What have you done lately? Type thing, and um, you have to get renewed every year, right? So it's not like a lifetime appointment you're in, and it's a it's a net sum zero. So if somebody new gets added then somebody has to not get renewed because it's based on budget, right? Every, actually, Betsy's told me that, that was, that's not correct. You said there is actually no budget to it. Um, I don't know. That, that's what she told me at dinner one time. Okay. There is a limit because oh, I'm sure there's, there's a, yeah. there is a financial expense yeah. to Microsoft for every MVP there is. Um, and it's so so that's that's what we're talking about, right? So there is a there is a limit, right? Um, overall, and it's it's an interesting program. Um, we'll leave it at that because some things have happened recently that have made it. Yeah, kind I know. Of weird. I know what you're referring to. Yeah. Um, but, but really, here, here's the deal, right? So for those of us who are MVPs, we understand it's not, you know, it's not this shiny thing, right? It's basically just saying, hey, thank you for what you did for Microsoft last year. Um, for those of you, for people who are in the tech world, in the Microsoft world, who don't really understand it, to them, it seems to be a bigger deal. People outside of the tech world, it's nothing, right? I was, uh, it, I was actually on the phone with the CEO of my largest customer, when my renewal email come through and I said, oh, I got renewed as MVP. He goes, what does that mean? Eh, nothing. Just don't worry about it, you know. <clears throat> no, I mean, it's, and I'm not making a lie. It's, it's, it's a very big honor and, you know, people, you know, I'm not trying to slight the program at all. Um, it's a huge honor, but it's also, right, we, we can't let it get to our heads that, you know, we're badasses just because we're MVPs, right? right. It's just something that, uh, it's Microsoft thanking us for a job well done. You're welcome. I appreciate what I get from it. And um, I'll continue doing what I'm doing, whether or not it's MVP. I mean, when I became an MVP, I didn't even know what the MVP program was. <laughs> like, I had done two years of, of, of hard speaking, as I talked about, you know, living in my car um, on weekends or couch surfing or, you know, doing whatever I can. And I was at a – where was I? It might have been Code Nash. And um, we, a bunch of us were talking, and somebody who I didn't know was saying, oh, you know, you know, tell me about yourself. And I said, well, you know, I'm kind of new. I've been only doing this speaking thing for two years. And he said, where have you spoken? And I just started listing off all the things I've done. And it turned out to be Brian Moore, who was a, the general manager for Central Division. And he turned to Brian Prince and Jeff Blankenberg and said, he needs to be an MVP. And I'm like, I, I'm, what does that mean? <laughs> right? You know, so he nominated me and everything else. I mean, it's it's nice, uh, but it's not this end-all, be-all thing. Right? It doesn't define, you know, if I meet somebody, whether or not they're an MVP, it doesn't make a difference to me. Yeah. You know, uh, it's not some crown that I, whatever. Probably ranted too long about that, but. No, but but you do bring up a good point. It is you know, going back to how it started. You know, how are renewals for MVP for uh, loyalty programs? It's going to be interesting to see how how the world handles that. Uh, um, yeah, talking about MVPs. I mean, you know, all the renewals just happened, but the, you know, it was through March, right? So yeah, you know, everyone still had you know a whole year's worth of. of of actual, you know, being able to do regular contributions they normally do. Uh, well, and keep in mind that, that speaking is only part of it, right? I mean, exactly. there are a lot of MVPs that probably work a lot harder because they're answering questions on all the forums and user voice and everything else. You know, their work hasn't soft off. Yeah, yeah I, I've, so I, I've since met someone who 
is MVP is for you know working the documentation. Never, never, <laughs> never speaks right. You know, it's um, I think because the speakers are, are more visible, it's you know we're more known as as the MVPs as the folks who are doing like documentation or or you know answering forms and all that type of stuff. But it's it's all important, right? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, no, definitely agree. So it'll be interesting to me talking about renewals and, and how things shape out is <clears throat> the the number of conferences that will remote survive this thing. Now I know you went virtual. Um, as of right now, nine forty three p.m. on Sunday night, July twelfth, and I'm couching this because I'm not sure when the recording goes up. Uh, since he deliver is still going to be held um, end of August. Uh, but within 24, 48 hours, I have to make a decision of what I'm going to do. Um, there's been a, a huge spike in reported cases, although hospitalizations are down and deaths are holding steady, which is tragic, but at least that hasn't spiked. Um, but so there's a possibility where we might have to postpone until next year. Um, I'm not going to do virtual. I know you're doing virtual at Code of Palooza. Um, you know, glad to be a part of it. It'll be interesting to see how it works. But there were a lot of conferences that um, I don't know if they're going to survive. And, yeah. and it's um, it's a shame, right? Because a lot of hard work go into it. But but the way I look at it, there, there's a couple different levels of conference, right? There's there's the, 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 the true code camps, which no fees are being paid, and those are few and far between. I think there might be three left. Then there's the small regional things, and, and mine is much smaller than yours. I mean, I usually get 500 people at mine, but it's a true nonprofit, right? I know yours is a nonprofit, right? You're not getting paid. I don't get paid. Uh, the money that we get goes into, like, if I get another sponsor last minute, they get better food, right? right. That's, that's how it works. Um, and I, I think those conferences, as long as they were, like, I got lucky. I'm, I'm lucky in that the venue that I have really likes my conference because they're basically a wedding hall. <laughs> um, and I'm the biggest corporate conference they have. And so they've already told me that even if I have, even though I have a contract in place, they'll just say, forget it, you know, we'll move it to next year. Um, so I'm fortunate, but not everybody's that fortunate. Uh, the ones that, that I see struggling are the ones that are for profit. Um, you know, you going virtual, I know you have to still spend money because it costs money to host a virtual thing. Um, you got to get the tech right. Um, you know, I just taught a class for scrum.org with um, a co-teacher, Richard Hunhausen, and we had to use the paid version of Zoom, which I didn't have, thankfully he had, right? But that, that costs money, so you can have breakout rooms and things like that. Um, but the, the, the conferences that are out there solely to make money I don't know how many are going to survive uh, because it's, I don't know. I mean, it's. I mean, my, my interesting part about that is, uh, I mean, number one, it, it still costs money to run a virtual conference. All right. And, uh, right. you know, there's a reason why our tickets are still $150 is because that's what it's going to cost me to, to run it. Assuming I have X number of attendees, right? Um, well, but I think you even put in there that you were like, if we're going to refund it, money left over, yeah, we're going to refund. And it's been cool. A lot of people have signed up and said, yeah, because we put the option there, right? You know, if you don't want to refund, because I, I got people telling me right away, they, they don't want to refund, put it, put it back into the community. Uh, and I have, I mean, because of the way I've restructured everything, I can do that. Before I couldn't really do that because it was Copalooza, right? And if I didn't spend the money in Copalooza, then I was screwed, right? You have the same problem, right? Um, right. I've restructured it all, and now all the groups that I run all fall under one company. So I can, you know, and, and so technically money go, it goes to the whole thing. It just happens to be the Copalooza takes like 99% of the money, right? Uh, because that's what it costs. But I, I found it interesting. The conferences that have gone virtual and are still the same price as they were when, when they're in person. All right now, those are for-profit conferences, right? Uh, and I'm like, okay, so you're making more margin on that, right? Uh, um, I'm sure their numbers are down. Uh, uh, so they're probably they're probably actually about even 
with, with the down numbers, but the you know extra margin. But you know, I don't know. I personally, I thought that was really strange, and I won't mention names, but I've seen a couple conferences. I'm like, well, it costs I mean, how I'm, much? I'm, I'll mention VS Live because I think they did it right. So I, I speak at all the VS Live shows when we have them. I, I do workshops for them. I've I'm, I'm been with them since 2006, so a long time VS Live speaker. And they didn't try and make a virtual conference. They just said, hey, we're not doing conferences. And they've switched gears and they're doing focus training. <laughs> so either four hour, eight hour, or two day training. And we we had already been doing this, you know, remote. You know, I've done my workshop several times for them um, with a blended in-person remote. Now it's all remote. And so it's not, you know, your typical conference format where it's 75-minute talks with a 20-minute break and you're not paying for that online. You're getting, you know, I'm doing one in December for VS Live. It's a two-day hands-on lab that combines ASP.NET Core and WPF and, you know, the .NET Core version of WPF. Um, but it's it's very focused, right? And, I, and I'm like, fine, that's, you're paying for an instructor to teach you a particular thing, and you're signing up for that. And I'm all for that, right? And I, I, I really applaud VS Live because this is their business to say, we're not going to try and, you know, run a multi-track, multi-speaker conference for the same rate that we would do. And, and you know, full transparency, speakers at the show get paid, right? So then how do you restructure that and everything else? Um, and so they said, hey, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to do these focus trainings, and we'll see you in 2021 mm -hmm. when the world goes back to normal. Yeah, so um, I'm scheduled for European uh, COG conference, and they're doing the same thing, right? They've uh, The regular conference has been postponed until, until next year, um, what they call their tutorials, right, where, which were their all-day workshops. Um, they asked each one of them, because I happen to be one of the ones that was doing one of the tutorials, and they, they, they asked us, are you willing to do this online? And, and, and again, full disclosure, I, I'm, I'm not getting anywhere near what, you, you know, probably what you get, but it's still something. Yeah. It's, enough, it's enough to make it worth it, you know, for me to spend a day doing it. So can you spend a day teaching console apps? I mean, is there enough content there? <laughs> Staff artists will spend a lot of time in the console, but... <laughs> Oh, it's an it's on graph databases. If you, know, if you have to oh, know, that actually be kind of cool. Well, yeah, I mean, you are the database guy. I mean, that's all your talks have been on databases, and yeah, that's kind of your strength. So, yeah, no, I mean, gra I mean, you know, but you know, I, I'm sure I've told you this, but you know, I ran into graph databases a couple of years ago, and I just absolutely love them. Um, they're, they're not right for everything, but uh, uh, when they make sense, they are they are wonderful. So, uh, um, you know, so yeah, so uh, I don't know if I'm looking forward to it or not. The, the kind of weird part is it's it's on uh, Central European time, but I'll be here, in, in, you know, on Eastern Daylight Savings time. You know, <laughs> that'll be fun. Uh, yeah, they, they, it was even funny. They were like, uh, they even asked me, like, well, we can either go from 10 to 5 or we can go to 11 to 6. And I was like, well, you might as well do it 10 to 5. I mean, I'm either up real early or I'm up just a little bit less real early, right? You know, what? what it doesn't really make a difference. Well, and, it, and that's a pretty good point, because last week I, I taught a class at Scrum.org, and it was remote, and uh, the attendees were on California, and so we were on California time. Now, as much as I travel, I'm pretty good at getting used to time zone differences. But what I struggled with was... So we started at noon, because I'm in Eastern. So we started at noon my time and ran until eight my time. Lunch was at 345, mm -hmm. right? And so I ate something at 1130 my time, which is why I normally eat lunch, which is fine. So then they all took off for 45 minutes, middle afternoon for me. And then my dinner time comes and we are mid class full you know full steam ahead and i'm just like my stomach is going rawr, 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 <laughs> the whole time i'm like sorry about that train running by my house but it happens to be in my belly 
but but I never, you know, I never had that problem. Like if I was in California teaching the class, it's all right. You know what? I'm eating lunch with you guys and, and everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's just, yeah. And that's from where you are, Central European time. That's six hours. Yeah. Yeah. So you're hosed either way. Yeah, that's that's why. Well, I, but, yeah. you, but you always get up in the morning, early in the morning anyway, right? For me to start at five o'clock in the morning, I'd have to just stay up. I mean, you'll I just wake up and, and get in your spit polished boots and go to your class. I actually don't naturally wake up that early anymore. I actually I never naturally woke up. I just get up because I've got things to do, and I don't you know I don't have a you know it's funny I'm not a morning person, but I'm also not opposed to mornings right. It's just I just get going right. Uh, uh, but yeah, I. I don't know. The weird part is, is it basically means I need to take two days off work because, you know, or at least a day and a half off work because I, you know, I'm gonna have to go to bed real early the night before. So. Yeah, but if you were going in person, that's a week, right? Well, yeah, but but I was gonna go to Nice, France. I mean, there, there's a, <laughs> there's a difference there, right? <laughs> I mean, that that was our that was our vacation this year. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you can get some videos that you could just, or make a background of, if you're using OBS, right? Make a moving background like you're on a gondola. <laughs> Wait, is that Nice? No, that's, no, that, that's, that's, that's Venice, but yeah. That's Venice. <laughs> they are both on the Mediterranean, at least. Yeah, well, so my, my uncle uh, lived just... Not too far from Nice. Um, my mom's brother retired to France, and then so we actually went there and and then saw the the wreck of the the aircraft carrier that flipped over when they launched. Mm -hmm. There's a whole long story that I want recorded. Um, we'll talk about that some other time. Uh, but anyway, what else? I have no idea how long these things are supposed to be. Oh, they're as long as we want them to be. Okay. <laughs> No, I was getting ready to wrap it up because I'm sure people are tired of listening to you and I just uh, chit chat. So how do we know? So I see nothing on my end. So can you actually see who's online? Like, do we actually have any listeners? Uh, I, I know we at least have Sean because he's been chatting. Okay. <laughs> so, it, so in theory, I have at least seven viewers. I don't. Know, Twitch is kind of bad about your viewer count. Um, okay. It tells me I have seven viewers right now. You never know if you really have seven. You know, actually, I know I have at least seven. Uh, you know, what is weird is uh, uh, sometimes there'll be more than that. And then you know, but then I can see chat. But you even can't. You are supposed to be able to look at the at the people who are users in chat, but you know, it isn't even always you know correct. But it's, it's a little bit weird. Yeah, I'm not really familiar with Twitch. I guess I'm old. So, but I did look you up, and and there's a whole bunch of talks that you did the Code It Live chat show. Yep, that's a uh, progress. Oh, but you were just on it. Okay. Yeah, Sam was interviewing me. Oh, on console apps? Was that in here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think we talked all about console apps. Nothing but. Well, they're very important. <laughs> they, hey, you know what? When you want to mil, uh, move 50 some odd million records, yes. Yeah, so this... <laughs> well, and to be, I mean, so I, I'm doing some work with Facebook integration. Um, I'm to, sorry. To pull ad, well, to pull ad results, right? To get, get reporting out of it so not to constantly go to the console. And, and I'm starting all, it will become a function app. That's, I did the same thing with Bing Ads. Mm -hmm. Bing Ads, their API, Azimex, it's also. Facebook, their API, REST. So I had no problem figuring out the REST thing. I had the SOAP and .NET Core just don't get along. Um, but no, I, I was about to defend you, and then you cut me off. But um, I always start with console apps to get my proof of concept, you know, get my spike working, and then I'll evolve it to something else. Well, so. admittedly, I mean that's part of what my job is, right? Is to is to get things started, and, and to do the initial proofs of concepts, and then I give it to the real developers to actually make it really work. <laughs> and move to from a console app to a class library. Exactly. 
No, actually, I usually write the class one, right? It's it's just it's to get everything else working, right? Now, do they make you do pull requests so you can't actually check things into production? Um, well, I'm supposed to. Yeah, I, uh, yes, I do have the rights. I could, I could just pull put stuff in there, but I would not do that. Yeah, it, it would be pretty bad of me, if, you know, for me to force everyone else to do it and not do it myself. Well, yeah, but you get some leeway, right? It's it's like I will. So everybody who works for me has to work off stories, right? And it's just, well, I want to make sure we got that accountability and traceability and things like that. But then I'll sit here probably after you and I get done and I'll open up Visual Studio and I'll code a bunch of things and totally forget to assign the stories to myself. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, no, I actually. I just said that to your seven viewers. So now they're going to be like tweeting, Phil doesn't follow his own rules. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I once had an interesting conversation with one of my employees because I, you know, because uh, I mentioned I'm like, well, I, I could just check things in master if I really wanted to. And he said, no, you can't. We, we got rules set up to it. I'm like, yeah, but when you're, you know, when you're the Azure DevOps admin, right? I, mean, I can do anything, right? It's, I wouldn't, right? I mean, that's, you know, it's not, you know, I mean, I wouldn't just because I'm, I'm scared of what I would do wrong, right? You know, but, yeah. Well, uh, to be clear, I wouldn't, I wouldn't push stuff straight into trunk. Um, but I will put stuff in the dev branch, you know, and then, and, and in my defense, I will talk to them the next working day because they're not usually awake when I'm awake working because I'm a night owl. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think they want to be called at two o'clock in the morning and talk about a feature. Um, but I'll talk to them the next day and say, Hey, I worked on these things. And, and luckily I've got really understanding people who work for me and they will, they'll fix the Azure board for me. See, that's the funny thing. I mean, last company I would do that, right? But that's because you know, I mean, you know, I was the senior developer by far, right? And, and uh, which is kind of scary. But uh, um, see, I got I beat you to it. <laughs> but uh, you know, like I said here, I mean, uh, one, I'm definitely outclassed. I mean, these guys, these guys are awesome. But uh, um, but I was, I well, it's kind of weird. I actually have a lower position than I did before, sort of at least by title but uh, um but it's actually i find it more important so i, I make sure i follow the rules even more so well, and again I, i'm not i'm i really don't do a whole lot of production code so it's not that it matters although i have to start really learning identity uh identity server because i'm going to be taking over our identity stuff identity server is cool you can do a lot with it yeah, we're, we're having stability issues. I got I to figure some of that out. I'm pretty sure that's not identity server. It's your implementation or how you use it. Could be. Oh, uh, we're, so, we're, 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 we're looking to that. Because also we're well, like, looking at some other things that we need to do, which is why I'm, I'm taking over it. Some integration I, stuff I, we I need to do. I know one of the two people that built identity server and still works on it. And... Um, you know, they've got checkbox from all the important people, the NSA, CIA, everything else, from a security standpoint. Um, it's a solid platform, right? Um, but again, the difference between that and something like an Okta or an Auth0 is you got to stand up the site that's going to host it, right? Mm -hmm. And run it, things like that. So if there's stability issues, look at your implementation details. Yeah. No, it's, that's what we're getting ready to do. And some of it actually has nothing to do with, with the dynamic server. It's some issues with, with Azure. Ah, see, the truth comes out. Well, I'm, I didn't hide that. It was just, like I said, we're having stability issues. I just say it was with identity server in itself. But, uh, uh, yeah. Well, awesome. Well, let me go ahead and end this. I mean, you and I can keep on talking about it. I'm going to end the public trans transmit of all this. So everyone's been joining us, which I know at least is Sean, because he's been chatting all along. Um, thanks for thanks for joining us. Uh, tomorrow we'll have our normal eleven thirty uh, stream. We'll be working on our Gremlin ORM, uh, and we we've got a week full. I forgot who who I've got. Who am I interviewing this week? Hold on a second. Got some. I know I got some good ones. Uh, let's see here, real quick. On. Yeah, on Tuesday, we'll be interviewing uh, Jeff Grammer, which is interesting. He's actually running for the Kentucky Legislative. Um, but he's also in tech. 
Uh, I'll have Matthew Groves on Wednesday, and I'll have Mitchell uh, Sellers on, on Thursday. Oh. From, um... Iowa. Yeah, yeah I know where he's from. The, um... So what's the thing that he, um... And uh, service bus. Right? Isn't he and service bus? I thought he was, uh... Hold on. He's, um... I don't think it was in service bus. Where is it? You would think it says it in his bio. It doesn't say in his bio. Oh, come on. Well, it, I think it's in his... Because he's actually talking about open source leadership. That's what he's going to be talking about. E and N. Oh, it's not in Yeah. Okay. So... All right. So, uh, so with that, uh, I bid everyone adieu and hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye.